Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Robbie Mickelson. I'm the organizer of Climate Link, the meetup, and also the founder of Climate Link, the company. And thank you for coming. Uh, so, Climate Link is many things, but tonight we're the meetup group. We meet monthly to showcase technologies being built to save the planet. And um, it's been, I've been organizing this for just over two years now. We've grown from about 600 to almost 2,000 here in San Francisco. Uh, we're about in five cities now, and about 10,000 across the total network with partner organizations. And so just uh, real quick on the schedule. So we'll run through about 10 minutes of introductions and announcements, then we'll get into actually why you came, the talks about the cool tech. And then we'll have some more networking and food, and then we go home. Um, so, PGE Blocks, um, we've created a little check-in to actually see who's here, and also so I can get your emails to send you the resources from tonight, the video, uh, the decks if they get shared, other specific announcements that get uh, spoken. So. Either on the meetup meetup page itself, or I just sent an email just before the meetup started uh, to the list. So if you could go there um, and click on that link to check in and give me your email address, that'd be greatly appreciated. If not, no worries. You just won't get the good stuff. Um, so first, I'd like to thank Pete. Pete Shoemaker runs the PG&E Pacific Energy Center, and they're our hosts. So let's all thank Pete, and he'll tell us about it. Uh, in person, of course, no. Thanks. I, I'm actually one of the uh, people on staff here, and this is a PGE facility, a energy training center. Um, first off, I have to do some brief safety announcements. If things start shaking, duck and cover, hold on under the tables. If we have to exit, go out the front door, half a block down to 4th and Howard, where the carousel is, and we'll take our business there. You know where the bed restrooms are around, on, around the side under there? There's other restrooms on the second floor against the far wall. How many people have been here before to attend a class or Great, well, a lot of people have, which is great. We love having Rami's stuff here. It fits with our mission perfectly. We also would like to introduce you to this facility, which we think is a great, great resource, undiscovered resource for a lot of people for your careers and all kinds of things. This is a free training facility funded by a small surcharge on everybody's pg &E bills. It's called a public purpose program charge and pays for a lot of other things, including well, the maintenance of this place. And there are all kinds of free classes here on all a wide variety of energy topics, including solar and building commissioning and carbon. And we have evening lectures like this. We have all kinds of topics. Lighting, there's a lighting class going right over there in that classroom there. Uh, we also have an extensive tool learning library downstairs, over 5,000 tools with experts that will lend you tools for free. IR cameras and blower doors and sensors and loggers and things like that. So we're here to help you do all kinds of energy efficiency and renewable energy projects, all free. So please, you know, come back again, take a look at our schedule. On the way out, you can get some resource material here. So happy to have you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. So normally there's Wi-Fi, but it's not working well tonight, so just use your own phone. Um, the food that you've already found, the bathrooms. Um, so real quickly on sort of climate link, the mission. Um, for the last several years, I've been working to deploy more capital into this space by matchmaking startups with appropriate sources of capital, whether that's investors, foundations, government agencies, um, you know, family and friends, whomever. And it grew and grew through this network. Um, and then after the IPCC report came out in October, it said, you know, you've been talking about billions of dollars, suddenly you're about a thousand X off, we need trillions of dollars. So I said, okay, how do we get to that point? Well, the only reasonable way that we'll get to trillions of dollars uh, in the time frame that we have to limit our temperature rise below three degrees Fahrenheit is if we have the biggest banks involved actually putting capital towards this. So, and the only way that they'll do that is if there's a bank giving them competition. So the plan is, let's start a bank, 
uh, to deploy hundreds of billions of dollars and force them to follow suit. Um, so it's going to be awesome. B Corp, you know, so it's do well by doing good. It'll live on your mobile phone. It's going to lend money for renewable energy, electric vehicles, ag tech, um, and it's going to be built off uh, a, a network, a connected network of people in the system. Um, so this is sort of what we've been building through the Climate Link Network and the different meetup groups over the past few years and are starting to uh, productize this. So creating the, uh, the investment connections, the who's hiring whom, um, you know, who becomes a customer, a customer of whom, so that we can actually create an automated system to help move the capital and resources flow through uh, the economy more effectively. So uh, that's more about sort of the giant mission. Now let's focus down on, on tonight. Um, if you want to be more a part of the community, you can join us on Slack. Unfortunately, the bit.ly links don't work if you're on the Gecko network, um, but you can do that through, uh, through your phone. Um, we've got a YouTube channel, so we're recording all of the talks, and then we post them, so if you want to see uh, Commissioner Hochschild of the California Energy Commission or last month's talks at uh, on AI and machine learning for grid energy management um, you can go there so let's see so I just started a, a newsletter that's going to go out every month to announce these meetups before uh, before we actually announce them on meetup um, how many of you got the email newsletter that wasn't from meetup all right, so just a couple people, great. So you all have a chance to sign up for this. Um, so in that, on the meetup announcement, it'll only talk about the meetup, but in the newsletter, it will include all the meetups plus uh, funding resources, other opportunities. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, please check that out. We've got a jobs board, uh, which is about to be uh, transferred over to our new site. And next bullet point. Who else is hiring? Anybody? Nobody's hiring. This is the first. Sweet. Is anybody looking for a job? One person, two people, three, four. Okay. So we've got a few job seekers, but nobody's hiring. Okay. Normally we do. Michael is hiring. What are you hiring for? I'm, uh, I'm looking for a data scientist. Uh, my company, Evolve Energy, we do a couple things. We pair wholesale dynamically changing prices with autonomous load response. So data scientists, please come check me out afterwards. Okay. What's the name of the company? Evolve Energy. Anybody else? Diego? Yes. Are you hiring? Yes, we are hiring. And I can yeah. speak So Diego's one of our speakers, and he'll talk about it when he gets up here. Yeah. Great. Thomas, Carbon Lighthouse, are you? I'm sure you guys are hiring. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm at Carbon Lighthouse. We do uh, demand side energy efficiency work in uh, commercial real estate. We are hiring data scientists and software engineers. Great. Um, one other thing that I talked about in the newsletter is that we're looking at actually creating a, an incubator for the climate tech community um, in the Bay Area. So it will have both co working space as well as functional lab space. So you're doing materials, chemistry, biotech, um, if you're building a biogasifier and you need combustion space, that will all be there, as well as directly connected into the mentor and capital networks uh, that we built up. Um, quick show of hands, is anybody interested in that? Co-working, yeah, two, three, four, okay. And so, now for the actual purpose of being here, uh, we're going to start off with Chris Bean from Google. Um, Chris has been uh, working on the Environmental Insights Explorer team for the past few years now, and he's wholly dedicated towards using his uh, software engineering training to help reduce emissions. And he's been trying to keep it cool for almost two decades now. He started an ice cream shop. That was his first job. Wow. Wow. All right, sorry, that was corny. <laughs> anyway, it's joke, not mine. yeah. So, please give it up for for Chris from Google. Is 
It should if you you plug in the dongle. Mm -hmm. Christopher Bean. Uh, as Robbie mentioned, software engineer at Google. Um, I am somewhat new in my career to the climate space and uh, sort of more recent uh, climate warrior. Um, I started up in, in ads, like many, um, and kind of found myself uh, here on a very long meandering path uh, as my uh, new passion to, to, uh, to pursue. Um, so, how many of you have heard of the Environmental Insights Explorer? Curious, okay. All right. All right, well that means that this is the right crowd to talk to. Uh, so recently, at September, uh, in September at Global uh, Climate Action Summit, we launched the uh, Excel I know, we, we shortened it to EIE uh, sometimes. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, I'll do a quick walkthrough through the UI, um, not, a, not a lot of demo, uh, and then we'll go over some Q&A and um, that's really where I would love to hear from all of you because we're actually a really early team and there are a number of different things that we're uh, trying to get a feel for, so really any feedback is, is appreciated, any thoughts, ideas, etc. Uh, so, First off, this was a labor of love between, um, again, our really small, scrappy team at Google uh, and the Global Covenant uh, of Mayors, or GCOM. Um, they came to us some number of years ago and um, talked about some of the challenges that they were having uh, that many, for, uh, for, for those of you that don't know, it's kind of uh, um, one of the collections of cities that are committing to address climate change um, all over the world. Uh, and they found that they had a challenge, which was to, uh, a lot of these cities have committed to reducing emissions, but uh, the next step they tend to be stuck at, which is how do you measure it uh, before you take action. So, um, so we're really grateful to have their expertise as part of this process. So what's our vision here? Uh, what, it really, really short, it's insights to solutions. Um, we have a really unique data set at Google, as you might imagine, um, and there's uh, quite a lot of interesting things that I think we can do with that, especially um, when it comes to quantifying the uh, emissions of you know, our real world, and ideally informing climate action plans, uh, programs and policies at the local level or city level, uh, and you know, the sort of blank uh, solutions um, in the space that are possible that we haven't even thought about, frankly. Uh, so uh, you may see that we at some time say environmental insights platform or explorer if I kind of um, say that the explorer refers to the actual uh, tool that's launched whereas the platform is kind of the larger team and, and the larger set of a suite, uh, suite of solution a suite of things that we're still trying to figure out and, um, and uh, explore. So some of our users uh, are tend to be at the city stakeholder level. Um, these are some of the relationships that we've been able to build, uh, and uh, both Victoria, Canada, and uh, Buenos Aires uh, are part of our um, launch, where we launched five cities this past fall. Um, but it's not limited to that. So yes, uh, we really want to inform you know, policies at the um, government level, uh, but I think there's an interesting angle for even the concerned citizen to kind of play with the um, you know, light scenario modeling, if you will, uh, and use that as a way of starting dialogue with, you know, folks around them, other concerned citizens, and, you know, who knows, maybe even kind of pitch it to some of their um, local representatives. 
the ideal for us and kind of why we're focusing on cities, uh, as you all probably know, it is uh, more than half and, and quickly growing uh, percentage of the global population. Uh, and of course, being in cities, we tend to generate the most uh, emissions. Um, so it's in that, uh, but at the same time, the city is local enough, so it kind of fits that Goldilocks zone of uh, kind of subverting some of the, you know, maybe national politics, pol not maybe, the national politics that are happening, uh, but also taking a really big bite out of the problem. So again, uh, you know, that's, we felt that was a really good place to kind of um, um, use as a fulcrum. Uh, so a couple of aspects about this um, where we, we want folks to be able to interact freely with the data is a, is a um, um, free tool uh, and we want people to be able to get a sense of the overall scale of their city. So the data tends to be quite aggregated over um, a year time scale, uh, over large buckets uh, for many reasons of course including privacy. Um, but also because we see that, you know, um, so those patterns, we, we really want to tease out at a larger level. Uh, and over time, we want to, for it to be a place or a hub to link to solutions. Um, you know, right now, those can be references, um, hopefully in the future, as more cities uh, start to deploy tactics uh, and be able to tie performance around that, maybe that's an uh, element that we can uh, pull in in the future. So if you want to play with it yourself, uh, you can. It's at insights.sustainability.google. And what is it? So uh, when you go to the Explorer, we, as I mentioned, we launched with five cities. These are the five. We uh, really have to balance kind of really touching on cities all across the globe, uh, small cities, big cities, but at the same time, cities that, um, that have data that we can actually validate against. Uh, and that's a whole tricky thing into itself. And when you dive into any one city, you're going to see a couple of things. Uh, we're, we have four key data sets, three of which are shown here. Uh, on the left are sources of emissions, building energy and transportation. On the right uh, are where we like to put, hopefully, a growing list of solutions. Uh, and currently, we have um, mapping your solar potential. Some of you, maybe many of you, are aware of Project Sunroof. Um, work with a lot of folks on the team, so uh, part of that has kind of been um, uh, folded into uh, the Explorer and, and uh, one of the you know, mitigation uh, tactics that are available. So building emissions, I'll talk a little bit about the data. Um, that is, if you basically think of Google Maps, that's essentially the easiest way to kind of explain um, the data that we're using. So that ranges from um, the building footprints uh, the categorizations of, of things, whether they are retail establishments, hospitals, uh, you know, hotels, etc., cetera, um, as well as even things like the building footprints, in, especially if we have 3D ones. So if you ever kind of zoomed in a little bit, you can see kind of a 3D outline of, of building. Uh, we're using that uh, to feed into our model to calculate building energy. Uh, and on the transportation side, of course, Google Maps, navigation is a big aspect, uh, is a big part of that. Uh, we are using uh, trips data, uh, aggregated uh, uh, over you know, a, a year and um, um, a couple of the dimensions that we'll dig into later, but aggregated at these large scales, um, as well as uh, location history uh, opt-in. Uh, on the solar side, a um, couple of things that power that are uh, helicopter imagery, satellite imagery, uh, for those that know uh, Earth Engine, um, that's one of the underpinnings and a super, super cool tool. Uh, my mind was absolutely blown when I first laid eyes on that. Um, so if you don't know that, definitely check that out, especially for the GIS folks um, in here. Uh, and, and so uh, also, and of course, some uh, Google Maps as, as well, as I mentioned, kind of uh, footprints, uh, building footprints and that sort of thing uh, to calculate solar potential. Uh, the fourth data set is kind of what I like to, you know, the kind of doom and gloom, or... That question. Do you mind the question in... in sure. Yeah. So okay. if, if, if uh, somebody in the city, uh, if, if the mayor uh, managed to pass a building, a stricter building code, uh, uh, all the buildings now have to have uh, now open windows, uh, you wouldn't see it with, or do you see it in the, in the data set? Uh, we, that's a great point. No, we wouldn't see that. So you're assuming uh, it's kind of average building efficiency yes. kind of? Yes, okay. yeah. 
Yeah, and, then, and so um, that was one of the aspects that we worked with uh, GCOM on uh, was to, uh, you know, we'll see later kind of the average intensity use per, per square meter. Uh, and so that, that comes from some of the GCOM uh, data and the work that they have access to. Uh, I think uh, the World Resources Institute helped to uh, build out some of that. So we, yeah, we do have those averages. Uh, and then, so tactics that happen, uh, we, you know, aren't going to be able to see that um, in, in real time. Uh, but it is an interesting aspect to try and encompass. Uh, I, I really didn't understand how did you get from Google Maps to numbers to the footprint? Did you create a methodology to calculate the footprints? Where, how do you really get there? Because of how you yeah, so um, the footprints in Google Maps, when you kind of really get kind of close and, and you know, closer and you really zoom in, those footprints already exist. So that's how, you know, we, we classify this whole graph with, you know, things like the, the name of the establishment and, you know, so the things that you see like phone numbers and hours and all that sort of thing um, that gets attached to a real space, an actual, you know, kind of polygon drawn in, in space. So we, we gather all our footprints from that. And the, of course, the MAPS team continues to improve that. So are you, when you say footprint, you're talking about carbon footprint with emissions factor and you are... Yeah, good. Is that what you're saying, or is it different footprint? I, I actually mean the actual building footprint, uh, so the actual area of the, of, the, of the footprint. But you bring up a good point uh, that, uh, of course, we are cal calculating the carbon footprint, and we do account for emissions factors. So we have, uh, again, <coughs> with GCOM, uh, we use emissions factors from CURB, um, <laughs> the climate, I don't even know what it stands for, climate for urban Cal sustainability. California Air Resources Board. That's CARB. That's CARB. Yeah, CARB. So the tool is CARB. It's this huge, massive spreadsheet that, um, that is powerful. But, um, so anyway, uh, we use emissions factors from, from that. And it's also a, a huge element, a uh, huge thing we're looking into to try and understand how we can improve on that. Because you know, as you, it sounds like you, you know, you know yeah. emissions factors can, are very coarse and you know, come with a lot of assumptions. Do you have, is it open, the sources? Uh, the sources of the, the data where you are collecting this data, or at least you say it, where, where is it coming from? I, I imagine CARB use IPCC emission factors, but you know, why do you use this CARB anyway? But uh, I, I'm just thinking, how can I access these real numbers? Because they look weird to me. So uh, we have a methodology site part of the site, so definitely check that out. Uh, if you have deeper questions, where there's both a feedback form and you know, come to talk to me after, or can okay. shoot you my, my email and we can definitely chat about that further. Um, of course, the, the underlying Google data from Maps, that of course is, is not open. <laughs> um, but the, the emissions factors, and as well as the, the methodology, I would say, you know, is fairly transparent, uh, but we have to, you know, make sure we keep the keep our you know our legal team happy and, and kind of um, not expose any of our data and of course um, you know all that uh, good stewardship stu that stewardship Does that help yeah. okay great so do we, uh, we are repurposing some NASA Earth Exchange models um, and. Uh, 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 scaling them to the city level and kind of projecting this business as usual. Um, I think one of the um, bits of feedback that we've heard is that 20 years is kind of too far, so I think we're considering um, pulling that time scale in uh, to may maybe make it feel more urgent. Uh, but really just a very simple way of um, kind of um, showing, um, you know, giving folks a sense of, you know, what is, what could be to come. Uh, so, Maybe this will also help, you know, uh, as we get into kind of walking through the tool, uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, but what I'd like to do is kind of um, walk through sort of a user story of, of sorts where, you know, where this is how we envision cities using it and some of the feedback that we're, we're hearing. So um, as a fictional scenario, we, we want um, to be able to have cities ask, ask themselves kind of, uh, questions like this, and this is of course a very oversimplified um, scenario, and we're only going to be playing with two dimensions here. But let's say you know Melbourne, the city of Melbourne, um, they're looking to reduce commercial emissions uh, by five percent in, in two years. Again, these are not their actual commitments, but just throwing some numbers out there. 
Uh, they want to do this because 86% of their billing energy emissions come from, uh, come from the commercial side. Uh, at the same time, it wants to grow economically. So they're looking to add uh, 10 million square meters of office space right, to attract new business to the area. How might they go about this? Uh, well, they jump into the building energy section of EAE. Um, and when you're there, you see a couple of things. Uh, you're going to see the residential and non-residential breakout. That's one of the um, bits of metadata that's attached to our uh, kind of building, you know, graph um, within Google Maps. Um, and uh, not only can you see that breakout, but we'll, you know, we're going to um, play with the customizing section here. And this is really where that we kind of like to say this light scenario modeling uh, comes into play. Uh, if you go there. Um, you're going to be presented with this screen, uh, and there are a couple of knobs that you can you can turn. Uh, you've got floor space. Uh, you have uh, the energy use intensity, which is the uh, you know kilowatt hours per square meter uh, per year, as well as the carbon intensity. So how much uh, you know what is your uh, emissions um, per um, unit, uh, and then you can we have a breakout between electricity and fuel. Uh, these these values are seeded with the emissions factors um, that uh, we uh, got uh, from our work with GCOM. Uh, and then so you can play with these ratios here as well as the uh, uh, carbon intensity of each. So going, going back to our scenario, um, we want to add 10 million square meters of office space. So we have, go ahead and go do that. Um, if you were in the tool live, you'd see that the, uh, the uh, estimate is going to obviously increase, right? Um, as, as we add floor space, but keep everything else um, the same. And in the case of, 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 the, of Melbourne, in the city, uh, they want to understand, like, well, if that's a goal, what can they do next? What are some of the values that they can play with um, to, to maybe get to, let's say, that 5% emissions? Um, so you can do things like maybe decrease energy use intensity. Maybe that's tied to a program of you know, LED, upgrading LED lighting or kind of incentives around uh, LED um, appliances at home or you know, something of, of that sort. Uh, in my case, um, I wanted to play with the uh, uh, grid intensity, and um, to me, it felt like um, you know 10% maybe seems reasonable. Uh, I don't know. This is really the con this is really where you know the, the folks that are working with this tool are going to bring their contextual understanding of their city and, and kind of um, add meaning to these numbers and why they're choosing these these numbers. Uh, you know, I'm not kind of saying that this is necessarily feasible, cheap, or any of, any of that sort. Um, but if we reduce that by 10%, we can see, okay, um, we can get to an, a, a, an emissions reduction of 6%, a lot of 6%. Um, again, this is a fairly straightforward um, scenario. There are, there's a lot of complexity to unpack right, um, in terms of what this means. Uh, obviously, adding, energy, uh, adding um, uh, building space means that you're going to have impacts on transportation, you're gonna have impacts on other things that are going to add to the carbon equation here. Um, so this is not meant to model all of those things. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, sort of, um, we'll leave that to the PhDs, if you will. Uh, but this is to begin to uh, really start that dialogue around what might be possible and how might that affect uh, numbers in um, um, really at scale. So another example here, um, we'll kind of take it one notch up and uh, we'll head to Buenos Aires. Uh, and they're looking to add electric buses to their fleet uh, powered by solar plus storage. So it's a lot to say in a single sentence. Uh, Please don't excoriate me for that. Uh, but they, you know, they're thinking of doing this. They they see this opportunity to shift uh, um, transportation modes, uh, as well as needing to, you know, um, buy these buses. Uh, they also, and this is actually a real thing that Buenos Aires has, uh, over the course of the last, uh, I think, decade or so, been adding a lot of bicycling infrastructure. Um, so they're looking to take advantage of all these things. Um, and how might they they go ahead and use transportation? Um, well, if they come into the transportation section of their city, uh, they'll see a couple things. Uh, one on the right are the travel bounds. So the general percentage and number of trips that are heading into a city, out of a city, and stay within the bounds, so starting and ending in your city. Um, we will break those trips out as well as the overall number of trips by mode. 
Um, and I know I'm going to get this question, how do we calculate the, or how do we uh, get to these modes here? Uh, for the most part, we infer them. Uh, so uh, we will, um, you know, as you're traveling throughout, uh, we're using a number of different signals to, uh, to um, infer the type, of, the type of, you know, thing that you're doing. So obviously if you're moving at 60 miles an hour um, over a freeway, you're probably not walking. Um, if you are moving at vehicle speed, uh, but that uh, corresponds with certain stops um, that uh, over known transit lines, uh, you know, you, uh, there's a good chance that you're going to be on public transit. Uh, you can actually look at this data yourself. Uh, if you go to, if you're signed in on maps and you look at your timeline feature, um, uh, this is powered by the same data. So sort of I know I would use the Google Maps kind of catch-all here, but a lot of this is really built on a lot of the great features that other teams in Google have built already, and we're actually just leveraging a lot of that. Um, I switched mine off because of privacy reasons, so I'm not counting as it was. <laughs> You're, shame so on you. Privacy, <laughs> privacy yes. will remain at it. Yes, exactly, yeah. So if you're not opting in, you, you know, you won't be a part of the sample. Um, it's an interesting aspect that we have to account for. Uh, obviously, all models tend to upscale uh, by a number of different factors. Um, this is going to be one of those for us, um, and it's quite a difficult one. Um, you just have lots of different like usage patterns, cultural things, socioeconomic um, aspects that uh, uh, factor into this as well. So uh, it may it may be one of our biggest challenges that in emissions factors being our next one. Um, so back to our scenario here. If you dive into Oh, I should, I kind of glossed over this on, on that previous page, but um, Buenos Aires is looking to dive into uh, the in-boundary trips. So the, so the trips that start and end within the city, uh, you know, their, their reasoning there might be because they have a little bit more control over that and they're shorter trips. Uh, and of course the bus fleet is going to, you know, we're going to weigh the magic wand and operate on a hub and spoke model. So, uh, you know, uh, they're going to be within, roughly within city limits. Uh, so if we uh, go into the in-boundary section, so there are the three, in, out, and within, uh, we're going to focus on these three modes. And I'm gonna, again going to you know, pull some numbers out of my magic hat here and say, uh, well, you know, our team you know, has done some work and, and you know, we think that maybe 3% of these, uh, of these miles are uh, mode shiftable, if that's a good word. Um, so let's go with that. Uh, of course, those miles have to go somewhere. People still have to get around, um, and we're going to be leveraging the bus uh, and bicycling infrastructure. So let's take those miles and add that to uh, buses and bikes, and that will uh, increase your bus number by approximately 12 percent, and uh, add on about 5 percent uh, uh, cycling miles as well. Um, those numbers seem actually pretty pretty reasonable to me. Again, I don't really have the context to really understand um, what this uh, might mean. This is really for that city planner to do. Um, but um, for example, when I was doing some research around this, the, the cycling infrastructure that's been added, when they did this uh, some number of years ago, then they added about 100 kilometers of, of, of road. Um, I think they were able to, in the early years, uh, triple you know cycling. Um, so of course, it's a small number on a big number, so that's going to have some, some impact. Uh, but you know, again, this is really just kind of uh, to illustrate what we what we think and hope is, is possible. Uh, since we added all these awesome new buses uh, and are just pulling all their energy from uh, our lovely sun, uh, we'll work in the carbon intensity of, of that as well, and so we'll decrease our overall, overall carbon intensity, um, and then that leads to a modest four um, percent. I think it's important and interesting to note that. These numbers are modest. Uh, I'm curious how folks generally feel about that um, because <coughs> you know it's an urgent thing that we're dealing with, um, and we all probably want to see numbers that are bigger than this, and it can maybe feel like slightly demoralizing. Um, but at the same time, there is a reality of, of um, just the world in which we have to work in. Uh, so we better for worse have to take a bit of an incremental approach. Uh, and then, of course, this is year over year, so you know it'll it'll really, uh, hopefully compound over time. And if we were to you know um, you know, have this all magically happen, of course there are other benefits right to to this um, that are harder to quantify. Um, we're not doing that here, but um, the uh, business activity around bike hubs tends to increase 
uh, when you put, lay down new bicycle infrastructure, obviously people are moving, so uh, they hopefully are at least a little bit uh, healthier. Um, there will be some better air quality and, and less congestion due to those uh, reduced uh, miles as well. Uh, so one of the aspects that we make um, available is this um, concept of, of sharing. Um, really, all it is is kind of just saving that data so you can send it around and um, share the customized estimates that you were able to, to make. Um, this is a, an interesting element that we're looking at um, because we're really not sure how people might use this. Um, what we hope for it to do is, again, we also get this conversation happening around a little bit more uh, data. And if you all have ideas on how this could be more impactful, I would love to hear them. So, sure. Do, do, do you have any plans with the data where you can perhaps uh, come up with an optimization model for traffic patterns? Um, if you see a bunch of cars going back and forth on the sit from point A to B and then back all the time, maybe you mm -hmm. put a bus line there. Um, something like that, which is Absolutely, yeah, so this is, can you repeat the question? Um, are there plans to um, <coughs> really take the modeling up a notch and um, uh, project uh, or predict uh, changes in the system uh, and take into account other signals like traffic and congestion? Yeah, I mean, in a way, um, so, it, 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 in a way, it is predicting, but you're, you're also just kind of coming up with an optimization model such that you, you, you can optimize traffic flow, but better yet, optimize the carbon emissions associated with, say, one particular road mm -hmm. um, in your city because it's just constant traffic. Yeah. Right now, no. In the short term, uh, we do get asked that quite a bit. Um, frankly, I think the short answer is it's kind of not really our, our that's not our forte in the sense that um, this is, um, you know, we're looking at this from um, a kind of um, data and, and kind of engineering perspective, but not necessarily from a uh, kind of, we're not domain experts in this space that I think we um, are thinking about it, but aren't, that there are no plans for that um, because there are a lot of folks, other folks that do it. Um, and honest, honestly, we're kind of not sure exactly how to approach that just yet. Uh, but it's something that we're thinking about, but again, there are no plans to do that. I, I think if you connect with some of your data scientists uh, who, who run optimization models and develop optimization models, they, you know, starting at a small scale, I'm sure they can come up with something that could inform urban planners um, and transportation planners to have, have a better design of city. I guess, I guess my, my thought is that's a pretty complicated tool. It's slightly different than what they're doing, and there are many companies who, who make those, those tools. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, thank you. So ex ex exactly that. So um, I didn't want to sort of go on the record saying Google was, was was couldn't you know like tackle such complexity, um, but it's not it's not really I guess where our phase is at right now. So um, going back to um, the GCOM cities, they are stuck at the stage of having any data at all. Um, so I guess we're kind of in the crawl phase. Um, is that possible? Could it be in their future? Is, is it doable? Probably. Um, but it's it's just so far so far ahead. Like well, honestly, we just haven't really, you know, um, there are so many things that get right at this foundational level that we haven't even uh, really begin to dig uh, dig too deep into that. Um, and yeah, there are you know, I'm sure there are PhDs in this audience right now that have done this <coughs> stuff. It is super complex. Um, and so yeah, I don't have a PhD bad question. Um, the, did the, the cities you mentioned, the, the five pilot cities, did like say Buenos Aires already have a carbon footprint for transport and uh, building energy usage? Uh, building energy, they, they did. I don't think they've done a transportation study before. Um, and uh, I would say that, of course, your Paris, Oakland, New York City, they, they have done that. Um, but your long tail of cities have, have not. They're yeah. kind of not even they, that. They that did. Place. 
They actually did. Buenos Aires? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I, I, I'm just really curious about what is the goal, real goal of this tool, because these look like very random numbers to me. I, I mean, I work for the C4E together with Pat, the mayor of Rio, from this complex of mayor that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. and Clay, and Rose Resources Institute. And, you know, the, I, I do see lots of potential uh, in terms of collecting different types of data, but how do you qualify these methodologies? And you know, those four percent could could mean something for public policies. But if they are just random numbers, nobody's going to use that as, that as a reference. You know, so I'm I'm just really curious about what what is really the goal with this tool. If you guys intend to get approval from you know YN FCC or any other um, organization to to you know really be able to to quantify impact in a different way that it's being done today, you know. I see potential, but I'm not, I, I'm kind of, kind of lost of how you guys are even calculate, making these calculations. So what's the goal? What's the, your main goal? The goal is to try and unblock cities so they can start informing climate action plans and these solutions. From what we have heard, and maybe this is not your experience, <coughs> Um, that tends to be the sticking point. So you kind of you can't act on, on what you don't measure, and they're having trouble measuring, uh, and then so therefore they don't act. Uh, that's really goal number one is to try and unblock that. The data, as you know, is super complex. Its accuracy is something that we're going to refine over over time and, and, and keep considering, keep looking at. Um, I would say that. Um, we're trying to do that in, in parallel. So these aren't, uh, so also and to address the question around validation, um, so where we have some ground truth, so either uh, VMT, VKT studies that uh, cities have already done, uh, we try and match those methodologies, uh, we look at the comparison of our GHG number to theirs, uh, we do some other kind of QA things to understand, to, uh, to ensure that uh, for the most part, um, the the um, there's no weirdness in the data or kind of like large anomalies. Um, you shouldn't generally see uh, too many trips coming into the city but never leaving the city. That would just kind of generally be kind of weird, right? So there's a symmetry there that I think is uh, that you would mostly expect. Um, so there are things around that that we're going to try and improve that. Uh, but I'll be the first to say that we this is this is our first step at this. Um, and that the nature of the problem is, is so difficult that there is no ground truth. Um, but what we do hope is that um, because we get such good coverage, right, uh, especially global coverage, right, so we're trying to act at the global scale, not necessarily just have one city or another city kind of improve, um, that we kind of think that this is um, better than the status quo for many of the cities that, there, that are out there, and that um, the scale of our data is uh, maybe enough to potentially be transformational. How are we doing on time? How about five more minutes? Five more minutes, okay. <laughs> Let me get through this real quick, and then let's just jump right to QA. Uh, because it, you know, I think that's kind of where we're um, seeing a lot of that. Uh, so, Sun, uh, sunroof and kind of the data feeds into here. Uh, what we're looking for cities to to really think about is how can they take advantage of their unique solar potential. Uh, we have a great case study working with San Jose um, around this, um, and um, you know I won't go too deep into this, but you can all play with this yourself. Uh, again, much of it is pulled from sunroof. Um, San Jose uh, was able to use Sunroof as one of the considerations for their uh, climate action plan, so we're excited for this. Um, they're using some of this information to inform the uh, one gigawatt project that they're uh, putting up. Um, and lastly, this is where, um, this is sort of an open field. Uh, one of the things that we're considering is whether or not there should be an API for this and what that would look like. So I would love for you all to sort of complete the sentence and, and send feedback through the, uh, there is a feedback form through the site itself, 
you know, you can report a bug and also to send feedback. Um, come to me to uh, up uh, to me afterwards and, and talk to me and kind of you know tell me you know if you were able to use an environmental insights API, uh, what would that look like? What would you like to see? What would you like to do with it? All right. <laughs> Uh, my question is, uh, first, how long does it take for you to build out the city, given the current level of depth of this data? And, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm going to ask. Uh, no, it's, it, it, so there are a couple of ways of answering that. How long does it take for us to calculate this for a city? Um, the incremental city is, you know, in terms of running the calculation, is, is pretty quick and easy. The, it's really about the validation bit. So, um, you know, we are trying to kind of develop a global model to fit onto all cities. This is a challenging thing. Um, and there are just going to be so many nuances that are going to be difficult to capture. So it's, the question is really about how long does it take to validate an additional uh, city? And what does that look like? And can we kind of develop a pattern over time? So. Um, to produce a bad number, quick. To produce a really good one is sort of um, still up for grabs. So how long did it take to build out, uh, say, San Jose? Um, so San, we, we didn't do San Jose for yeah, as a whole. Uh, it was just the that San Jose used the Project Sunroof data to inform their work. Uh, but um, I would say we've been kind of working on this for uh, through the past year. So um, it's still kind of early innings, but yeah, we have put a little little bit of work into it. So one year for five cities, not, not super great, but I think we can improve on that. Right there. Yep. Um, it's well known that cities emit CO2, cars, et cetera, power plants. Has there been any consideration of um, using um, CO2 sensors at a high altitude you know, over over cities to as a one data point to see if that would correlate. You know, with the number of car trips and so forth. Um, is that is that a possibility? You think? Yeah, I mean that's kind of the exact thing that Earth Engine is is good for. Um, so can we use remote sensing uh, and um, you know um, um, various sensors, uh, CO2 sensors, um, Sentinel Five P um, has I think a to correlate. Yes, that is absolutely something that we're thinking about. Um, are we doing that right now? No, not 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 just yet. Um, again, the team is very small, <laughs> um, so hopefully we can build to that over time. Okay, how can we increase your team? Because we all need to know. We're in Alameda um, on an island, so we're going underwater here. <laughs> that, yeah, that that's a great question, and I think part of that is to help us. How can how can this tool continue, like unblock cities on this? Cities are our users. If they, if we can, if they can come to this and, and say, "This is useful. I saw this. Did this." Um, that is going to release the resources increasingly. So um, I, I would hope to to address that to take into account these things. And of course, cities are going to care about how how valid the, the data is, how trustworthy it is. So that is just you know really the if, if, if nothing else, a single point that we have to get right. Do you just use Google Data for transportation, or do you collaborate with Apple or any of the other large players? Nope. <laughs> no <point. laughs> No, like we, we, if the, so we're not, we have not collaborated over this. Um, there, we don't use our data sets. I don't think we would even bother to ask because I'm pretty sure the answer would be no. Um, there also would be very significant uh, privacy considerations as, as part of that uh, as well. Uh, so, no. So, how do you account for the discrepancy between obviously not everyone uses Google Maps? So, mm -hmm. do you just scale up or how do yes. you? Yes. Exactly. Um, that was kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, we have. I sort of like to think of it as we have fewer assumptions and fewer things to scale by, but uh, that also increases the weight of each of those uh, variables. Um, and it is just a super complex thing, right? As you sort of touched on, um, uh, penetration rate of, of different um, uh, usage habits and devices, and even the quality of the device matters so much across the world that impacts the number. 
And sorry, one last thing about that. Do you, are you guys using, I saw rooftop solar only. I mean, are you not looking at ground mount solar or other types of systems that would? Currently rooftop only. One more. So I was uh, really interested in the, the slide you showed where you could send feedback to a city and thinking about, you know, mostly you talk about this from the user being a city, but also as a public engagement tool. Mm -hmm. And so what what are the current lines of, of thought in that area? Is that something, like what are been said about that in cities or where do you see that going? Uh, the sharing feature, uh, user, this this tool is primarily designed for, for city stakeholders, but the concerned citizen, there is this kind of potential for them to kind of create a scenario and share that and somehow kind of use that to increase engagement or conversation around that um, particular thing, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. The, so I, yeah, I'm asking, I guess, yeah, where do you see, do you see that going anywhere or having traction? Or? Yeah, so... Um, we are putting that out there as a really short way of testing that. So the jury is still out. Um, I don't know of anything that sort of is, is like that, um, but if that is one of the outcomes, that would be a very interesting one. Let's give it up, Chris. Thank you again. And he'll be around after if you want to ask him some more questions. Um, and also email out his email address uh, for anybody who's given that to us. So our next speaker is Diego Saez Gil, the founder and CEO of Pachama. Uh, you need a USB-C, um, I'll grab that. So while I'm speaking, I'll just walk over here and grab this box. Um, so Diego is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, before this, he built the world's first uh, GPS smart suitcase. You might have seen it, I think it was, was a Kickstarter. So yeah, you can know with that. Um, so this suitcase, it had a battery pack, it had a GPS, you could find it uh, with your phone. So in case the airport lost it, you knew exactly uh, where it was in the world, and then you could tell them where to send it to you. Um, and that finished, uh, <laughs> to say nicely. Um, and then he decided to start a Pachama. Uh, this last fall is October, right? That's right. Yeah. So. Dave will tell us how he's going to you know, help us save the forest. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone. Um, let's see if this loads. Yes, uh, as Ravi said, I'm the founder of Pachama. It's a new startup, um, and yes, what we're trying to do is to unlock nature to help solve climate change. Um, and you know, we say that our technology has been under development for over three billion years photosynthesis converting carbon into biomass and um, the insight for uh, this idea came uh, yes after you know I, I've been an entrepreneur for uh, eight years in the US I'm originally from Argentina and I learned a lot about Silicon Valley building technologies building teams and uh, implementing uh, compliance markets and some of them are doing it for the wrong, for the right reasons, right? So there are many companies that, uh, in their boards, they decided that they want to be carbon neutral, and they started buying carbon credits. So we said, okay, he, here there is something. Um, last year, according to the World Bank, over 80 billion dollars went into carbon markets, you know, both uh, through compliance markets and carbon tax initiatives. There are uh, commitments for over five billion dollars for forest carbon projects. Uh, there is a program called the Red Plus program, uh, sponsored by the UN. Um, and if we were to unlock these two billion hectares of potential restoration for the planet, this would be the ability to capture 80 gigatons of additional CO2 every year, uh, with the potential for 800 billion dollars in carbon offsets uh, that you know uh, could come from these corporations. Uh, this is you know almost twice the money that Apple has in the bank. So it's not that much money uh, in, in the corporate world. Um, so, but when we look at how the certification and verification of forest carbon credits are done today, uh, it's, it's actually very inefficient and, and it doesn't use a lot of technology. So, most of the verifications are done manually. They send crews to the forest to measure the size of the trees, uh, to estimate how much biomass the tree has. Uh, they do partial measures and extrapolations. The process takes uh, several years. It costs thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars that have to be paid 
by the project developer, which is basically the forest owner. Um, and then it's difficult to monitor, monitor periodically what happens afterwards you certify a forest for current projects. So as a result of that, not many people around the world are doing um, certification of forest and, and using that to finance uh, forest restoration projects. And as a result of that, also companies are not actually buying that many forest carbon credits. Most of the budget for carbon credits are actually going to other type of projects that are actually less impactful in terms of taking carbon out of the atmosphere. So this is the idea that we got. So let's start a platform that brings fast, affordable, and reliable verification using satellite images, uh, drone images, LiDAR data, using harnessing all the technologies that we have today for remote sensing, and machine learning algorithms, deep learning algorithms that actually work today to estimate a biomass on a picture, to project and predict future biomass changes. And then let's build a platform that makes it very, very easy for a forest owner to participate in this market and to sell these carbon credits to these buyers that we mentioned before. Uh, and this is what we're building. We just got started um, and uh, are still you know, figuring out what's the best way to uh, you know, uh, add value is, 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 is you know, a lot of things that need to be built. Um, but we basically started with the basics of, okay, let's look at what are the satellite images that are available out there, um, and let's start working with them. Um, so we uh, took a uh, uh, forest project in Peru in the Amazon and started uh, playing around with their data, and, um, and, and, and I arrived to the conclusion that, yes, uh, a lot of precision can be achieved with remote sensing uh, methodologies. Um, so here's a little video of um, that we used to introduce a company uh, today. Uh, we did it with my cousin in one week, so it's not really good quality, but it explains a little bit what we do. Let's see. You might need a tether to your phone or mm. my phone. Well, yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter. You can go to the website, and the website, the, the video is in the website. Basically, the video explained the same time I explained to you. Um, so, yes, we. This is the team. We're just, you know, a few uh, engineers and founders with some experience building some technology platforms. We just hired this guy though that did his PhD in forest remote sensing, and he actually scanned uh, the entirety of New England. Uh, and measure biomass and carbon storage of forests on New England and compare that to ground data uh, and achieved uh, total precision. And um, so we're very excited to start using the algorithms that he developed to do the same in other parts of the world uh, like South America and the Amazon. Um, so one of the things that we did also as we started you know, the company, we started going and meeting with forest owners, trying to understand their problems and, uh, and their situation, and in doing so we got connected to over 150,000 hectares of certifiable land in South America, uh, and it was a great validation to see that people want to participate in this. Uh, the people that own uh, n native forests in South America they actually would rather not cut it down to do agriculture, but they need to get paid, right? So this is a mechanism that can actually uh, help them uh, have a, an income out of protecting the forest, and this income can actually be used to restore many areas that were cut down for a pasture in the past, um, in which it makes a lot of economic sense to do uh, reforestation today. So uh, the why now kind of question uh, is, you know, all these technologies uh, weren't available five years ago. Nanosatellites that can produce high frequency, uh, high resolution images. Uh, we have you know, companies such as you know, Planet Labs today and you know, Capella, Satellogic, that are producing you know, these images. Deep learning algorithms, finally they work so well. Thanks to Silicon Valley, uh, we can use uh, those algorithms. Um, and then drones that actually have a high range. We're talking with several companies that are uh, doing autonomous drones that recharge themselves and then they can go and, 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 and scan large plots of land. Um, uh, LiDAR. LiDAR is a technology that's being pushed forward uh, by self-driving cars uh, most recently. And you can uh, purchase actually a LiDAR device for $700 that is this size that you can attach to a drone and then you can have 
a three-dimensional cloud of points that then you can analyze with machine learning algorithms and, and get very specific um, with uh, the estimation of uh, biomass in a forest. Um, and then finally, the Paris Agreement, which to me is a form of technology. The Paris Agreement actually uh, has changed a lot of things. And while what we read in the news is that the President of the US wants to leave the Paris Agreement, the reality is that all over the world, there are more and more regulations coming into place to uh, make companies compensate for their emissions, and so actually also making the voluntary market grow. Um, so our moonshot uh, goal for the next five years is to help restore one million hectares of forest, which is the size of Hawaii Island. And uh, to do that, we just need to make this technology work at scale. Um, it will take a lot of work, and it will take a lot of collaborations with the different verification bodies that are out there. Um, and, but the technology is there. Um, the demand for carbon credit is there. Um, and the land to do reforestation is there. So it's just about making it happen, hopefully. What we need, um, we uh, need to connect with carbon buyers. We need to connect with forest project developers. And we do need talented people that want to work for this mission. So come talk to me if you are looking for a new opportunity. Uh, we're a small team, but we're going to be uh, adding new team members in the next uh, few months. So that's Pajama and questions. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much for the talk. It's super interesting and I appreciate the passion a lot. I have a question about a few years ago, Rafael Correa in Ecuador who was covered in Yasuni, which is the most biodiverse place on the earth, yeah. told the UN, I'm going to put this part of the Amazon, I'm going to conserve it, it can pay up. I've told the World Bank, the ADB, all these corporations, and none of them fulfilled the promise. The demand for credits was dead. So what other dynamics have changed beside technology that can make your project successful? Yeah, no, absolutely. There are a lot of failure stories uh, about these type of frameworks from the past. Uh, and it's unfortunate because it reduces the credibility of all these ideas that are actually really good. Um, I would say that, you know, as I said, one of the problems that uh, forests used to have for carbon credits is that it's very difficult to monitor what happens in the forest, right? So there are many stories in which uh, a project got certified and then the uh, owners of the land didn't honor the commitments of not cutting down the trees, right? And there was no way to get sort of like a, a, a monitor that in real time. But now with satellite images with high frequency, you can monitor in real time, you can gain, give more credibility to, to the buyers. And then in, in the side of the buyers, I mean, yes, the carbon grades markets have been around since the Kyoto Protocol, right? Started in, in, in the 90s. Um, in the 2008, 2009 crisis crash, Companies didn't care about climate change anymore. Uh, I think that, number one, the Paris Agreement, again, is a, a, a big push uh, uh, for the compliance market. And for the voluntary market, frankly, stakeholders are starting to demand companies. Last week, I don't know if you saw in the New York Times, 6,000 employees of Amazon signed a letter to Jeff Bezos demanding action on climate change. Um, the same week, uh, the CEO of Shell announced a $300 million budget for carbon offset with a special focus on, on forest uh, carbon credits. Um, so yes, call me uh, an idealist. I think this, this market has a new chance, a new life, and we'll try to uh, contribute to make it happen. So related to the previous question, can you just briefly explain what the economics are of uh, turning cut down into trees, maintaining trees, and how trees increase their mass and how? How sure. Do you get compensated for that around the world? Yeah, I mean, it's case by case. Uh, the, the economics are very complex. And, 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 and I should say that there are two types of forest carbon credit projects. There is avoidance of deforestation, in which you measure the carbon storage of the forest. And then you have to estimate the probability of that forest being taken down. And then you're basically uh, issuing uh, certificates for this carbon that is. Uh, uh, avoided to be released to the atmosphere in a way. And then on the other hand you have uh, reforestation projects or, or basically restoration projects, forests that were degraded 
or deforested in which you can you know bring on new biomass um, and you know in terms of the economics I mean the price of carbon is not super clear of carbon credits uh, compliance markets uh, generally try to establish a price, a set price. The California carbon trade is you know, around $15 per ton. The European Union trading scheme is around $30 per ton. And in the voluntary market, there's a wide range. Um, but you know, you, you could say that it ranges between $5 and $20 per ton, depending on the projects. Uh, prices of carbon actually uh, you know, make sense in terms of the biomass that can be generated in a certain uh, hectare to compete with other activities, right? And, and the answer is that there are a lot of areas in which that's true, right? Um, there are many uh, places around the world in which uh, forests were taken down to do pasture uh, or cattle ranching, and now these practices have changed and they use less land. So there is land that is maybe not suitable for, for agriculture today, but it could be reforested, right? So, um, and, and then when you, when you look at the price of actually, or the cost of actually doing reforestation projects, uh, it's actually the most, uh, the cheapest way to take out carbon from atmosphere, you know, as compared to any other uh, technology that is uh, in development today to capture carbon. And how many tons do you get from a hectare? How many tons of carbon? So in the Amazon, uh, if you have a native forest that is standing, it has 200 tons per hectare. I wonder about the, the durability of that capture. You know, it's important to capture a lot, but also to keep it there for a long time. But how, so imagine that, that like uh, a dense weathering where you store uh, CO2 in rocks, uh, it's going to work, but it's, since it's a chemical bond that's very stable, it's going to have more value than, than trees. How do you see that? Do you pay uh, a ton uh, capture for a year? There's a price on the time that you store it? Or, or does that, does, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, this is a concept of uh, sort of like permanence and additionality, uh, which are criteria that are considered in these projects. And they're generally formulas that consider the balance of carbon. Because it's true, I mean, a forest, when a tree dies, and trees do die like every living being, uh, you know, there's, there's carbon that might be released, right? Although you, know, you, can, you can do management to uh, assure that this carbon doesn't get released. Uh, you know, to atmosphere, but there are formulas that consider these uh, sort of uh, fluctuations. Um, and yeah, and the other thing that I didn't mention, which is besides carbon capturing value of forests, there is a lot of other values like biodiversity and you know water uh, balancing on ecosystems that have a secondary impact on climate. So uh, sometimes you know, uh, even though. Uh, the formulas also consider that. The protocols of, for forests also consider uh, biodiversity value and uh, sort of ecosystemic value of forest. Uh, Which would not apply to the other system exactly. I mentioned. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and I think we should do everything, by the way. I think we should do air capture research. We well, should. Air capture is not going to work, but. Uh, you know, but we should try it. You know, so like, what I'm saying is that it's not that I'm a fundamentalist of forest. I, we want to work on this because somebody has to do it, right? But we should explore all, all technologies. Um, well, we, we, to have a forest certification, you're assuming that there's a forest, but we also want to do reforestation to land that has been deforested. Right. So do you know of or foresee any programs that measure the potential of uh, carbon offset and then pay in advance to incentivize landowners to reforest? Yeah, I mean, definitely a good point uh, in that today, if you want to do soy agriculture, you go to a bank and they lend you money. If you want to do reforestation for carbon credits, nobody will give you money. Although there are some financial institutions, but it's really little. Um, so yes, that's one of the things that we also want to help with data. With data that combines uh, sort of like historical uh, information about what was in the land in the last you know, 20, 30 years, uh, weather um, and you know, topography and so forth, we could you know, help uh, estimate the potential for reforestation in different land areas. And then with that, we could facilitate elements for these project developers to get financing um, and to sort of like uh, not pre sell carbon credits, but to get financing for the future carbon credits that could, gener could be generated in the land. The issue about the, you know, it takes time for a tree to grow. Yeah. And so my mind has like a big gap right now between the seedling yeah. and a full fledged tree. And I, I wonder. Um, 
we're, we're, we're the markers for that kind of uh, yeah. car carbon sequestering in growth patterns. Yeah, yeah, that, that's part of the challenge. And, and again, today uh, we do have the ability to basically scan an, an area that's been just reforested with, with drones and have a track of the saplings. And then you do a model to see how much carbon uh, this forest is going to capture in the next 10, 20 years. And then based on that, have a sort of a financial model that help the project developer uh, understand what the economics of the project are. Um, and, and that's why many times there will be many projects combine avoidance of deforestation that can be paid right away with reforestation projects. Yeah. Can I add to that? Uh, it's just that any carbon offset project is a long-term vision, so you're always going to think if it's a transportation system, for example, you're only going to look at you know, 10 years ahead how much that metro system will be, you know, uh, transporting people. So it's kind of the same situation. Yeah, as far yeah as but many of the protocols consider 100 years commitments uh, for the projects. Yes. Um, so the pilot project you mentioned was in South Africa. Do you have anything happening in the U.S.? Because I would imagine the market here is way more complicated than, like, Having a carbon market here is more complicated than others. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's complicated everywhere, to be honest. Uh, there are different uh, complications in South America. But yes, we're starting to look now uh, at you know California, the California uh, you know protocols in the California carbon trade market, and there's a lot of forest restoration that can be done in California after the fires. Uh, we're looking at New England. Uh, we're looking at the Mississippi Basin. Yes, we're 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 in the process of scanning all the. Uh, potentialities and to understand where to focus first. Okay, as a, as a follow up question, when you look at land owners, do you just, do you try to find, I guess, owners who have large amounts of land, or are you also looking at like a tree that's like right outside here and why? You so, yeah, I mean, today, because of the cost of uh, certification, again, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases, that is such a barrier to entry that only big projects can participate in this market. One of the goals that we have is to make it cheaper and faster and easier to understand so that smaller uh, forest owners can participate on the market. Um, there, being, there are project developers that aggregate small project, small forest, and then they together work on a verification. But yeah, I mean, we think that you know, small landowners should, should be able to participate, yeah. Are you building your own protocol or just using the voluntary um, system? So for now we are using the protocols that are out there and building basically a methodology that is aligned with the protocols that are out there. Uh, we hope in the future to contribute to the design of new protocols that consider the technologies that we have available today. Most of the protocols were uh, designed many years ago um, and you know, while they get updated, uh, I think there's definitely an opportunity to to update the protocols for the new technologies. Can you talk a little more about uh, your modeling capabilities on, on the technology side? Like, what types of data, you know, besides satellite image, imagery, if anything, are you using? Uh, what would you like to have more of, and what are you using for like training sets for the deep learning? Yeah, uh, we are using, uh, we're very excited about LiDAR. Um, there are certain areas of the world, the US in particular, and Canada in particular, for example, in which uh, we have a lot of data available, uh, airborne uh, LiDAR captured uh, data. Um, and uh, yeah, we're using that to sort of like, you know, do an estimation of biomass, uh, to do tree counting, you know, um, and um, <coughs> And yes, comparing that data to uh, estimations that have been done uh, in the ground, right? Um, we, you know, we're looking at all the data that's out there, right? And, and again, some of my team members have been uh, focused on that and collecting data. Uh, we're uploading a lot to Google Earth Engine, by the way. We're using Google Earth Engine, it's an awesome product. Um, and uh, yeah, talking to the companies that are bringing on new data. One, one uh, data source we're very excited is the JEDI program. Uh, basically, NASA sent a LiDAR to the International Space Station, and they're going to be scanning all the forests of the world. It's not going to be a complete scan. They're going to have like dots on each uh, uh, sort of like a hectare of land. But uh, with that LiDAR data, we're going to be able to train models and then you know uh, 
uh, basically extrapolate or, or use those models. Yeah. 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 Are you looking at the different types of trees? So. Um, whether it's a chestnut or oak or eucalyptus and, and how fast they grow. And, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely it's, it's, it's important to know the species uh, because they have different carbon density and, and therefore, you know, different carbon capturing capacity in a way, uh, different rates of growth. Um, with LiDAR, uh, it's starting to become possible to do species detection, but it's, it's early. Um, we think in a few years it's going to be uh, definitely possible. Um, but but yeah, you do you do need to know uh, species. Yeah. How, how does your research interact with California's desire to go carbon neutral by 2045, but we're burning tens of hundreds of thousands of hectares more per year right now? How does that, how does that play out in this, and who's responsible for that? Yeah. Release from the forest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Uh, Definitely, the, you know, California is, is uh, very proactive, uh, and, and the cap and trade carbon program is one of the best in the world. It still needs to have. Do they take you know, a hit when they burn the forest? Do they have to have to adjust their cap? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I'm not sure how how the forest fires play on on their models, um, and unfortunately, we're gonna have more fires with warming, right? Um, but um, but definitely, I mean, again. This is about now bringing more funding to restore those forests. Um, but yes, definitely we're interested on collaborating more with California on that front. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I really love this technology, you know that. Um, but I'm super curious to know what are the other um, social value, carbon value that you are bringing with this technology, not only from the tree perspective, but also the biodiversity, like uh, the species uh, that, you know, from the, the fauna that is in there. Um, how you guys are going to um, publicize, I mean, capitalize over this? Because you can really sell a credit over a premium cost if you, you know, if you know how many real species you have in a forest. So are you guys thinking of this? Yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, there are several protocols, like there's a Plan Vivo protocol that considers uh, biodiversity and community uh, impact as well. You know, the, the, the Red Plus program in the Amazon will have a lot of impact on, on, on indigenous communities that live on those forests, um, and there's always a social impact. Uh, so these protocols will hope to help uh, make those protocols work. For example, I was talking today with someone about uh, building a mobile app that helps the people on the ground also do the uh, sort of like collection of data, but also the monitoring, you know. So this is, you know, uh, it's definitely something to, to consider. And, and, and again, it's one of the things that these type of projects have as an additional benefit of just capturing carbon. Yeah. Are you also involved in like the blue carbon space? So like, um, <coughs> also ocean. Metros, Definitely super exciting. Um, we haven't uh, studied it a lot, but yes, I mean, we, we will definitely look into it. There's a huge potential, and uh, there aren't many protocols that pay enough attention to it. There's a lot that can be uh, known with satellite images about uh, the state of uh, ocean forest. So, yes, exciting space. Definitely, we want to take a look at it. Yeah, and uh, Alameda, <coughs> we have. Uh, company called Sail Drone, so it's going out in the oceans looking at the uh, Gulf forest, phy phytoplankton and so forth. Uh, but in forestry, um, there's, I'm, I'm wondering if you're thinking of partnering with uh, some of the drone companies to plant trees, like biocarbon engineering and other ones, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean definitely, I spoke with biocarbon engineering, with drone seed as well. Uh, I think what they're doing is super exciting and useful if this works and we can drive you know, billions of dollars into this type of projects, we will need uh, technologies to do the reforestation faster. And yes, I think that these, these companies are exciting. Uh, we share investors with one of them, so yes, definitely we'll partner with them. Um, so are you looking to grow beyond just, like the, I know there's no market for like air pollutants, so are you looking to go beyond carbon to estimating how much like forests can take a pollutant? Socks and knocks and all of 
quality and quality yeah. You know, I'll say, you know, for now we, we have to be super focused on, on making this, you know, small thing uh, work and small thing is actually quite big. Uh, but so for now we're just going to focus on the voluntary market, uh, specific geographies in which we can help accelerate the verification of current credits and connect the parties. <coughs> but yes, in the future, hopefully we can be uh, a source of uh, data and knowledge for all sort of projects uh, around the forest and around you know the environment in general. If you look at uh, what happens with solar, right? solar had financing issues and their companies, and now the name is escaping, why San Francisco? that uh, is uh, eventually into insurance and that kind of stuff because they have the data to right. evaluate the risk and also this is easier to finance and so everything is easier and solar, you know, it's a decapital cost at the beginning so it's, uh, the radiation is free so yeah. it's, it's very important for the project. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the data, you know, there's going to be an explosion of data and uh, it's going to be important to, to be able to harness it. So yeah, yeah. we make a financing from impossible to, you know, routine. So. Yeah. Um, so, pull on up. Um, there was a paper about uh, a decade or so ago that showed that uh, it was a, a simulation um, that if you reforested in like a clear cut area in the north, like in Canada, oh, where it's very snowy, that the trees would actually increase warming rather than decrease because you're removing some of the, the snow cover. Um, do you know, I mean, that's now 10, 12 years old. I don't know if the, the science has changed or the carbon markets have changed uh, to sort of incorporate that of where, like if you've got a, a tree growing in the north but it's displacing uh, snow, will that have a, a lower value in the carbon market? Yeah, I, I did see those papers um, and you know, I think it's a, it's a, other things are happening in polar areas that are, you know, causing the albedo effect, right? I mean, yeah. the, the, the ice is melting and the land is becoming browner and, and that is produce, you know, producing more and more warming. Um, but yes, definitely there are places in which trees have a better carbon capturing impact than in others. That's why we want to focus on tropical forests, frankly. Tropical forests are the carbon capturing machine of the planet. And, um, but yeah, I mean, that being said, I think that uh, in, in the poles, uh, there, there's areas in which reforesting at mass scale makes sense, in others, Maybe not, and, and, and it's important to use the data to know where, yeah. <clears throat> Without being too specific, uh, just generally speaking, like who are you, your investors now? Who are you giving your service to? And like, how do you see the growth of your, your company? Can you repeat yeah. that question? So who are our investors and our customers? Uh, so I mean, definitely confidential information. Um, uh, but you know, I, I can share that we just did white Combinator. Uh, you know, very fortunate to have that community helping us out, and uh, you know, uh, as a result of Y Combinator, we, we did raise a round that we haven't announced yet. But um, two of the investors already tweeted about it, so I guess that they, they made it public. And their great investor, Chris Saka, who was the first investor in Uber and Twitter, and Paul Graham, who's the founder of uh, YC and first investor in Airbnb. So yes, we're very lucky to have the validation of those folks that also have access to you know, more capital and, 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 and to other great companies in, in Silicon Valley. So uh, yes, we want to start here. Uh, in terms of companies that we're going to reach out to sell current credits, we're going to focus here in, in Silicon Valley, uh, where there are four looking companies um, that, that care. Um, so yeah. Maybe you covered this earlier and I missed it, but do you only focus on modeling and calculating above ground biomass carbon sequestration? Uh, or do you also have the abilities with your technology and algorithms to look at in-ground sequestration that might be fungal or other organism medium? Yeah, for now it's above ground uh, verification. Uh, definitely there's a huge potential of below ground, but, uh, but I think with remote sensing it's going to be difficult for some time. Uh, eventually, yes. I mean, there is, there are models that, that can be built. Uh, I guess you know, with, with you know, advanced lidar and you know, combining that with you know, ground data. Um, but yes, we're aware of the big potential of, of, of soil. Yeah, another way to fund uh, this would be 
um, there's a company in Seattle called Nori. It's like the uh, sushi. And they're doing a cryptocurrency where one coin, one token would equal one um, ton of sequestered car carbon and verify it. They're starting with uh, regener regenerative agriculture first, using biochar and so forth, which I recommend for the plants, planted trees. And they're all they're looking to go to trees and then eventually to kelp forests, as that can be verified as well. Yeah, I, I know those guys. It's awesome what they're doing. And yes, I, I, we want to see more and more startups trying different approaches. Yeah. All right. One Thank more. you very much. Anyone? All right.